Hello, my name is Anthony Aaron Bureau. I got active in the deaf community back in 1979 after taking a special education course as it related to speech and communication disorders. Um, the professor in that class announced that the Catholic Deaf Center at the time was offering community sign language classes. And as a child, I'd always wanted to learn more about American Sign Language. Uh, when I was young, my sister and I looked in the encyclopedia. We saw the manual alphabet, and we both learned the manual alphabet and were able to communicate via finger spelling quite a bit, but didn't have a vocabulary of sign language. So I took the sign course, met my first deaf individual. Uh, at the, as I stated, the class was offered by the Catholic Deaf Center. So a deaf gentleman by the name of Esther McAllister and Sister Diane both uh, team taught the classroom, Esther teaching us the ASL, Sister Diane teaching us the vocabulary. After that 12-week course, my thirst for sign language, my thirst for more information on the deaf community increased, and not having any friends or relatives involved in uh, deafness, uh, Sister Diane suggested that I come to the Deaf Center and volunteer some time. And it just so happened this was over the uh, winter break from school that I had the free time, went over, and I met with Sister Diane and some of the workers at the Catholic Deaf Center and began seeing and learning more and more about the deaf community. When the semester started again in January of 1980, I took my next sign language class through the Catholic Deaf Center. In addition to at the University of New Orleans, one of the master students was an interpreter in the drama department, and she taught a sign language class. It was a six-week course. Conflicted with my schedule, but the success of that class uh, was so pronounced that the next semester they offered a full semester of American Sign Language at the University of New Orleans. So um, after my two classes at the Deaf Center, after you get to the second level of community course, you don't have enough students to go into a third level. So I was able to take the class at the University of New Orleans, and that's where I really got an interest in sign language and in the deaf community. Um, in our city, New Orleans, there's Delgado Community College, which offers an interpreter training program. And I was able to transfer um, many of my courses from the University of New Orleans and was able to obtain a degree, not only uh, my AA degree at Delgado, but I was also to graduate with my bachelor's from the University of New Orleans. Uh, Subsequent to graduating with a BA in television communication, I was wondering, well, how will I tie in my degree in uh, communication with deafness? Well, at that time, captioning first came out, and I thought, well, uh, I contacted WGBH in Boston, and they were the forerunners in terms of captioning, and I thought, well, maybe I could apply captioning, uh, communication, deafness, that tie-in. Uh, didn't work, got involved in the community, and uh, that's when I got really interested in terms of sign language and working within the African-American deaf community. Uh, so after I graduated, I worked as a uh, a part-time interpreter for the Catholic Deaf Center, going on to community assignments. And interpreting back then was nothing like interpreting is now. Team interpreting, uh, two-hour minimum, uh, one interpreter going for a five, six-hour job, things like that. It was in the uh, beginning stages in my infancy of interpreting, and I knew there was more to it that I had to learn about. So I availed myself to any workshop, any training opportunity that I could, would drive to Little Rock, Arkansas, would drive to Tampa, St. Pete, Florida, would go anywhere that the training was. Um, after becoming more and more involved in the profession, got hired on full-time as a full-time interpreter and interpreter coordinator. Uh, at that time, uh, my thirst for ASL was increasing and increasing, uh, so I decided to go for my master's in linguistics of American Sign Language. Applied to Gallaudet and was accepted to their uh, program in linguistics of American Sign Language. And there I did more of my research on sign language variation in the African American deaf community. Upon graduating from uh, Gallaudet, I came back to New Orleans and worked as a vocational rehabilitation counselor for the deaf. Uh, there I had a, a full deaf caseload and worked for four years in terms of providing opportunities for African Americans and deaf individuals and also uh, other deaf individuals in the city to avail themselves to opportunities as it related to employment, employment training, uh, going to college, things like that. Anything that would get them to the end result of getting uh, gainfully employed. 
Um, after leaving vocational rehabilitation, I decided to further my studies and work towards my PhD in deaf studies. I enrolled in the University of New Orleans in their deaf education program, and I'm currently in the doctoral program uh, in the dissertation stage of my program, ready to finish up this summer uh, with my PhD and become more active in terms of teaching. I'm an adjunct faculty member at Xavier University where we're developing a deaf studies program and teaching sign language courses to university students who are going into the profession of uh, medicine, audiology, and speech pathology. Thank you. Hello, my name is Anthony Aaron Bureau. I'm president of the National Alliance of Black Interpreters. Let me give you a little bit of history about the organization. Back in 1980, in the New York City area, Washington, D.C. area, there was a large concentration of African-American interpreters who found that there was a need, uh, a void, that there was not being met as interpreters uh, for interpreter training students in terms of getting into the profession of interpreting, namely areas regarding certification, uh, contacting regarding jobs, and also involvement on a regional or national level. Pamela Dinkins, who, um, was, who is in New York City and felt the need for an organization that catered specifically to African Americans in the profession, came up with the name NAOBI, the National Alliance of Black Interpreters. Oftentimes at conferences, African-American professionals working in the field of deafness got together and they talked about the need for the establishment of an organization such as NAOBI. Granted, there is the Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf, but many felt that their needs were not being satisfied. Uh, a recruitment, an outreach to the African-American community wasn't as prevalent as they felt that, as they felt not coming from the national organization. In the 90s, uh, as a result of African Americans attending several conferences through NBDA, through some of the co some of the uh, conferences happening at a college or a university, they got together and felt that it's time, it's ripe to establish an organization such as the National Alliance of Black Interpreters. The Washington D.C. area became first and uh, foremost. Um, active in terms of establishing uh, the organization. On a national level, we did have individuals who were actively working in terms of developing a database to get information, trying to um, recognize where the African American interpreters were, where they were working, how many were certified, and things like that. But DC started uh, in the area of training more African American interpreters in terms of providing training. Um, some of the things that had happened from that was the development of what's, what was known as the summit, whereby African-American speakers and presenters got together and presented on topics that were crucial to African-Americans wanting to either get into the field of deafness and also so to maintain their certification level in the field of deafness. Uh, a board was elected and became active in terms of uh, developing more plans and establishing the organization. And in the mid-90s, uh, the summits went from uh, the Washington, D.C., New York area to establishing summits outside of D.C. These summits became conferences in 1999. We had our conference in Myrtle Beach this year, 2000. The conference will be in New York. Next year in 2001, our conference is slated for Las Vegas, and bids will be entertained for the year 2002. The mission statement of the National Alliance of Black Interpreters is to promote excellence and empowerment among African American blacks in the profession of sign language interpreting in the context of a multicultural, multilingual environment. Some of the goals of the National Alliance of Black Interpreters include the recruitment of more African Americans into the profession of interpreting. We know based on the numbers that are out there uh, totaled by the National Multicultural Interpreting Project and the Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf, there are few African American interpreters who are in the profession. A lot of African American interpreters who are working in the profession try to do their best in terms of recruiting, but is getting word into the African American community that interpreting is a profession and you can earn money and make a living at interpreting. 
For those interpreters who do get into the profession, the retention, making sure that interpreting African-American students who attend interpreter training programs can stay there, that there is the support there, that there are, there are services that they can avail themselves to in terms of maintaining uh, a certain level of uh, sign language and also opportunities for advancement in terms of becoming certified once they've graduated from the program. Naomi is also active in working towards the goal of offering mentoring, sh mentoring opportunities. Uh, currently, where we do most of our mentoring is at the National Black Deaf Advocates Conference. Uh, interpreters who are hired at the conference are mentored, uh, these are non-certified interpreters, are mentored with a certified interpreter. And throughout the conference, that qualified uh, interpreter is going around and getting feedback one-on-one -on -one throughout the whole week of the conference with that one interpreter. Uh, the group, the mentoring group, sit down at various times throughout the week, and they meet with the interpreters to work on specific goals. It's not that we go and work throughout the whole conference on every and anything that it will take for them to get this certification, but these pre-certified interpreters are working on specific areas which they feel that they are lacking in terms of obtaining that certification. Uh, attending the Naomi Conference. Naomi Conference's uh, mentoring program is being established there to work with interpreters to identify certain needs, to provide training to not only the pre-certified interpreters, but certified interpreters in terms of maintaining their certification. Uh, opportunities whereby uh, they are looking for topics that they feel they need to be trained on or get more information on as the profession is changing and growing and also the development of uh, distance mentoring, whereby interpreters in rural areas, interpreters in areas where they're the only African American in that particular area, can send a videotape somewhere to a nationally certified interpreter and get feedback, uh, have someone to talk to, someone to network and mentor with in terms of developing or increasing their skills. Another goal is to increase the number of certified interpreters in the profession. Currently, through the NBDA conference, uh, Naomi and NBDA works in concert in terms of setting up testing through the National Association for the Deaf to increase the number of uh, pre-certified interpreters in the field to get them certified. Uh, through the last two to three conferences at NBDA, we've been successful in increasing tremendously the number of African American interpreters who have a, certif a certification, namely a national certification. Another goal is the, director, the development of a directory of African American interpreters. Through um, the use of the Blue Book, which has been commonly con uh, called, African American individuals are listed whereby you can look to get information as it relates to an interpreter in a particular area in addition to a task by the National Multicultural Interpreting Project to develop a directory of not only African American interpreters but other culturally diverse interpreters. Another goal Naomi is working towards is documenting the history of African American interpreters in the profession. We notice that when we read the literature, watch the videotapes, there's a presence, um, a non-presence of African Americans in, the, in both the books and on the videos. Trying to document who are our first interpreters, where the interpreters in this, uh, from this particular cultural group come from, and seeing if we can get the names, the stories, the, um, the information as it pertains to our particular group. Another thing that the National Alliance of Black Interpreters does is to work in collaboration with the National Black Dev Advocates. We reciprocate at both conferences providing uh, a pool of speakers and interpreting services. MBDA uh, provides the, hires the largest number of African American interpreters at any one given event. Uh, working with RID to help them recognize the need to meet the needs for more culturally diverse interpreters in the profession and also to work at, in terms of tracking certification of African Americans in the profession. Uh, working with the Conference of Interpreter Training Trainers to see that the needs of African American interpreter training students are met. Uh, a lot of times when students go into the program, they're the only individual in that program and they need certain uh, certain assistance in terms of developing a role model in terms of 
a mentor or developing other things that will assist them in maintaining um, the status in the program. And also working with the National Multicultural Interpreting Project, working in collaboration with NMIP in terms of developing the African American curriculum that will be infused in FITP programs. Going towards our future, Naomi started out as a large group of interpreters in one particular area, namely the Washington, D.C. area, New York City, Chicago area. Um, we found that more and more as the information has gotten out through uh, interacting with other organizations, through articles in certain magazines such as Emerge and Black Enterprises, individuals are becoming more cognizant that interpreting as a profession, and then they're looking for a support group to turn to, namely Naomi is that particular group. Uh, last year, our membership voted to establish chapters in order to meet the needs of the growing number of individuals interested in the interpreting profession. Namely, our chapters include the first chapter, Washington, D.C., our second chapter, Mobile, Alabama, our third chapter, New York City, and the fourth chapter, Chicago, Illinois, and our fifth chapter, New Orleans, Louisiana. These chapters are active in their local regions, providing interpreter training opportunities, workshops, uh, mentoring opportunities for African-American interpreters who are already in the profession, in addition to, re to uh, completing some of our goals in terms of uh, recruiting more African-Americans into the profession and also assisting in retaining those African-American interpreter training students in some of the programs. Naomi is instrumental in getting word out regarding our training opportunities and information on the organization through the World Wide Web. Our World Wide Website, www.naobi.org, lists our mission statement, our current board of, all, uh, board of directors. It lists information as it relates to training opportunities, such as the Naobi conferences and other training opportunities happening throughout the United States. Uh, encouraging African American and black interpreters in our profession to publish. We talk about the lack of information on African Americans out there in the field of interpreting. However, we're instrumental in, in, um, in encouraging our African American interpreters to get out there and start writing about what we're seeing, what we're doing, and how it's affecting us as uh, individuals, and also how it affects the profession. Also, the development of videotapes in terms of uh, seeing African Americans on sign language videotapes, seeing African American deaf individuals and uh, documenting their uh, variation as it relates to the signing community and the deaf community. In closing, what we'd like to do is recognize the need for organizations such as Naomi and how it fosters the growth and the professional development of African Americans in our profession of interpreting. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Anthony Aaron Bureau. I'm the African American team leader with the National Multicultural Interpreting Project. I've been involved in the field of deafness for the past 20 plus years, working mainly in the African American deaf community. Today my lecture is gonna revolve around the topic of working together, how to become more effective in a multicultural organization, the African American community. When we work with the African American community, many of us who are involved in the profession get to know most of our consumers by working with organizations such as the National Black Dev Advocates and the National Alliance of Black Interpreters. Members of both the hearing and deaf community are, um, are often active in both of those organizations. If you're interested in working with this particular group of individuals, deaf, deaf and hard of hearing, hearing individuals, you should try to attend functions that relate to um, workshops, community training functions, educational functions, put on by some of the local, regional, and community groups. Attending also activities that relate to the African American community is also a way of understanding an organization and the culture of a particular group. For example, by attending an NAACP function or attending a Kwanzaa function, uh, attending a black arts festival or a black history festival. Observing uh, individuals at these particular events, uh, observing the language use, the body language, observing the, some of the cultural ramifications uh, in terms of group dynamics, how individuals who are 
members of the in-group, the African-American group, interact amongst each other, and when uh, members outside of the group come in to notice those dynamics. Aside from meeting African-American hearing individuals at functions such as Kwanzaa, African-American history events, Meeting African-American deaf individuals, one primary source is to attend a National Black Deaf Advocates Conference. They meet yearly. Um, one year, a host chapter will host it. The next year, the board will host it in various locations throughout the United States. Fortunately, NBDA has had the opportunity to meet in such faraway places as the Virgin Islands and Montego Bay, Jamaica. Going to the conferences, you get to attend uh, workshops that are put on by African American deaf individuals. You get to hear speakers talk about issues as it relates to the African American deaf community, African American deaf culture, history, and things of that nature. It's also a good opportunity to look at videotapes of older African American deaf individuals to see some of the subtleties that were happening back when schools were segregated. A lot of your older black deaf individuals, for example, tend to fingerspell more because sign language was not as prevalent in the school system or the educational system back then as it is now. Also sign variations. African Americans tended to have variations in certain signs um, when they communicated with each other. Because there was no formal sign language uh, taught in the schools, uh, signs that, say for example, if one school didn't have a sign for tree, and another school did, then when they met at particular functions, they would share these signs with each other. In terms of African American deaf discourse amongst interpreters and uh, deaf consumers, um, some things to look at are important to notice, and one would be body language. Uh, within the African American deaf community, and it, and it transgresses across hearing and deaf communities, body language in terms of the way we stand, how we communicate, what's the intent of a particular posture. Um, in personal conversations, uh, is it a discussion? Someone uh, outside of the group looking in may think it's a heated argument or a, or a hot debate. Uh, in classes before a large audience, how is the movement, eye contact, what is the eye gaze looking like? You know, is there a hidden message in the way that an individual walks, the way they tilt their head? Certain things that we do in particular discourse, for example, when African American women are talking together to stress a particular point or put emphasis on the statement, the neck movement, the head nod, and things like that. Uh, dress, cultural dress, uh, colorful dress, uh, ethnocentric dress, Afrocentric dress. Uh, it's really, really important uh, to what a person is wearing and when they wear it. For example, in African culture, the longer the garb, the more formal the occasion. Uh, a, a suit tends to connote a business or a serious meeting, whereas a sports shirt, a shirt with a collar, or a bandage shirt, that tends to connote some other type of function. So dress is important, how we see uh, individuals when they attend a particular service, be it uh, Baptist, Methodist, AME, church service. You know, the dress is different in an African-American church as it may be in another culture's church. Uh, our expressions. How do we express ourselves in terms of our body language, our facial expression, hand movements and gestures, body, um, body movements? Um, when we're speaking, uh, what, what's happening with the hands? Are they, you know, are they used to connote certain information, to stress certain information in the lecture? How the body swing from left to right as the person moving, interacting with the audience. A lot of expressions, body language, and movements are important. And then the dialect with whom we're speaking. Uh, how are we going to speak uh, when we address an audience of non-black individuals as we well, opposed to addressing an audience of black individuals? Uh, what's going to be certain differences in the word selection? Uh, when we talk on a personal level, um, when we talk on a social level, the demeanor, the words, the vocabulary, all of that is different. So there are a lot of things that we look and take into consideration when we look to work more effectively with multicultural organizations. It's a lot involved in terms of observing, looking to see what exactly is happening, to take, sit back and take note, take notice of certain dynamics that are happening in group and out group. 
when we go into a group, don't necessarily think that we can automatically fit in, you know, be invited in, uh, take time to look, learn, listen, and observe exactly what it is that we're looking to get. And with those tips, we should be able to more effectively communicate and inter interact on a more um, appropriate basis with that particular community group. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.